Hey everybody, welcome back to another Judgment Commentary of Bake Monogatari, but today I'm going to be checking out episode 6. But last time on episode 5, we found out that Hachikuji Mayoi was in fact the snail all along, and that she was a ghost who had died 10 years ago after getting run over while trying to cross the street so that she could get to her mom's house. Yeah. Now in hindsight, I mean, I honestly should have seen it coming that she was in fact the snail. I think I even commented as much when I, back in episode three or so, because she said it flat out that I am a lost snail. She said that, so, you know, thinking about it, probably should have seen it coming. But yeah, because of the way that she died, being unable to get where she was trying to go, she was cursed to have to prevent other people from getting to where they need to go to make lost people perpetually lost forever. Specifically, individuals who don't want to get where they're trying to go. It's kind of weird. Like, she gravitates towards people who have run away from home and don't want to go back, and she makes it so that they can't go back. That is her curse. But even after figuring this out, Aroragi still decided to help her out and was able to get her back home so that she could find closure, and then she moved on to the next life. Or so you'd think, but it turns out she liked hanging out with Aroragi so much that she decided to come back anyway so that she could pal around with him some more. Honestly, I'm okay with that. Kind of heartwarming in its own way. Now, if I may comment on one scene in particular from last time, the one with uh, Aroragi and Mayue, you know, back when they were still at the park and he was... Okay, you know what I mean. Yeah, that scene, it did kind of not sit with me super well, and I had somebody talking about how, you know, perversion is just part of what <laughs> Monogatari brings to the table, as I've already seen in a few of the other episodes so far, and you know what? Fine. Perversion, in and of itself, I've got no problems with that being used as a comedic tool. I mean, this is anime we're talking about here. I'm more than familiar with the technique being used. I mean, heck, I've seen and enjoyed OG Dragon Ball, so trust me, I get it. It's not inherently exempt from being funny, but just, uh, you know, the, the general nature of the scene itself didn't sit with me personally, but, I mean, honestly, if you really think about it, it wasn't even as bad as it sounds, because Araragi was mostly just joking around anyway, really. It wasn't, like, fully serious. I guess I was mostly just shocked just because of how seriously they handled the concept in episode 2 with Senju Gohara, and then here, like, three episodes later, they're kind of playing it for laughs, but it, it's not really the same circumstance. It's different. Aruragi was joking around, but it just caught me off guard. Let's just say that. In any case, we got ourselves a monkey to check out, so let's return. Girl. Well, that's one way to get the blood flowing, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose so. Wow. Okay, then. That was an interesting episode to start us off with here. We got Tsuruga now. She was a, she was and is a star basketball player who unfortunately seemed to have recently gotten an injury on her hand. There's been a lot of emphasis on hands because uh, specifically this uh, monster person who showed up and clocked him, there was a focus on the, on the hand. So, hmm, could it be the hand of Tsuruga? Is she some kind of uh, super-powered monster demon? I don't have enough info to say. Maybe she, maybe it's like a Jekyll and Hyde <laughs> sort of thing, where at night she transforms into this beast or something. Who knows? We don't even know how her hand was injured or to what extent it was. It seems pretty bad, obviously, if you have to bandage it all the way up like that. That would usually mean a burn of some kind if it's going to have to be wrapped up like that, or it's been severely cut up, or maybe she ties it up to, to hold back her true power. I'm really harping on that, aren't I? Now about the other stuff of the episode, Senju Gohara, she keep, you know, they, they, they keep bringing up the whole tsundere thing. She said she considers herself more of a tsundere, 
She hasn't really shown that too much, really. I think I've brought it up before, but really she doesn't. If anything, she kind of acts very yandere at times more than tsundere. She doesn't, she's not like, oh, Baka, I don't like you, I hate you and stuff. She's actually very direct and forward with Araragi about her feelings, so... Yeah, Sundere? Not exactly. I don't think she has a good read on herself. I mean, when she found out he had any interaction with that other girl at all, she threatened to gouge out his eye with a pen, <laughs> saying, it's cool, it'll regenerate, right? <sighs> Psychotic. Also, would it regenerate? He has like a low-level healing factor. Can it bring back organs like that? Probably. And besides that, when it comes to Senjugahara and Suruga, they were described as being, you know, like pillars of the athletics community in middle school, but she didn't know if they necessarily had too much interaction with one another when they definitely did, as uh, we also heard. But that didn't go well. Suruga wanted to help Senjugahara with her problem, but, of course, Senjugahara, being Senjugahara, lashed out at her for it, threatening her with her school supplies, and she backed off because, yeah, most people would do that. I'm really jumping around here, but to get back to the thing at the end, when Araragi was getting pummeled, there was um, some details that I noticed that I'm thinking back to about how the emphasis on their hand, when the hand was there and all bloodied, it looked like there was like scraps of cloth underneath uh, the cloak, and then it cut to like a shot of like the bandaged hand, didn't it? Which is the implication that the hand had been bandaged up and had been unbandaged. Which, if that's the case, lends to what I was saying before. Is Suga harboring a Mr. Hyde? Or perhaps something else? Hmm. I mean, they've usually been pretty direct with their foreshadowy storytelling, where if you just connect the pieces, you can pretty easily determine some of the stuff that's going on if you think about it in the right direction, but who knows if that is the right direction or not. I mean, I, I even <laughs> considered the possibility of, of Mayoi being uh, the, the snail. I just didn't know what that meant yet, so I kind of cast it aside by the time I eventually got to that point, but in this case, who knows? Maybe I'm right. But anyway, I think that's going to be it for now, guys, but thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed. Subscribe to be updated on more. That would be great. Next time, episode 7, part 2 of the Saruga Monkey. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, where the monkey comes into play on this one because it hasn't really seemed to be introduced yet except in the beginning thing with all the, the monkey visuals and stuffs, but we'll see about that. And yeah, definitely a solid beginning to the arc, mixing in that little bit of action right at the end with the sudden violence. I mean, wow! Talk about a tone shift. That just came completely out of nowhere, caught me off guard, woke me up a bit. <laughs> But like I already said, we'll find out more about that next time, and I hope to catch you guys there. But till then, I will see you guys all later!